This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arn Labs podcast, our special guest today. And I've been trying to get this guy for years, or well, maybe not years, but at least 10 something months. John Calhoun. John, dude, thank you. So glad we finally got a chance to connect. Thanks for having me, Bill. Yeah, it's it's uh, been a while because I've been busy working on updates for things and just you get busy with stuff and it's like, I don't know if I have extra time for other podcasts right now. Doesn't help as well that I do the Go Time podcast. So it's like I've already got one podcast trying to get more of my time. No, I get it. I mean, you got um, you got all that training material that I've only heard amazing things about, and you got to constantly keep that up to date and maintained. And uh, you got young kids, and um, you know, life is life is good, but it's busy, so it's it's all cool. Yeah, I think the last time you reached out was when I was in the process of adopting my son, so. That was also a rather hectic time. Yeah, yeah. but we're, we're here now. We're here together. So uh, we're gonna. I can't wait to kind of hear your story. And but before anything else, give everybody two minutes of what you're doing today, career wise. Career wise. So I create Go courses that are. They're mostly designed for people sort of just getting into Go, but not like the absolute beginner stage. It's more like you've learned the basics of like how to write Hello World, that sort of thing, and you're looking to sort of take that next next step, moving towards junior developer type role. So the most popular one is Go for Sizes, which is just some free exercises, and like kind of my motivation there was that every time people talk about like learning Go, they're like, well, just go build something. And then you see beginners, they go out and they're like, okay, I'm going to go build something. And they pick a project. And what they pick is like way too challenging and they just don't realize it. So they jump in and then they get stuck and then just sort of they're like, oh, I'm not a good developer. That's the issue. And really that's not the case. They just picked a project that wasn't feasible. So my goal there was to sort of be like, all right, I'm going to curate some projects that you can work on that'll help you get better, that'll push you, but they're not so hard that you're going to like just hit a brick wall and not be able to make progress. So, so yeah, it started with Gopher Sizes, and I've also got like a web development course, a testing course, and some others that I'm constantly working on adding updates to. And I have an algorithms one that I want to put more time into, but it's been hard to find the time for that. Um, and that one stems from the fact that when I was in college, I really enjoyed doing uh, like programming competition type stuff. So like Google Code Jam, that sort of thing that was really algorithm focused. So I really liked learning about algorithms. And I felt like the way math books taught them was not the best way for me to learn at least. So I was trying to come up with a course that sort of showed how those algorithms worked with like real code that people could look at versus like looking at a math formula, which just didn't help me. So that's awesome. So two things out of that one, um, all of your products are for sale and it's all um, side of self study, right? It's all video content and you can um, review that in in your time. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, they're all self-paced, like just web courses or like either with video or some of them have a text component. Um, some of them are free and some of them are for sale. So like Go for Sizes and the algorithms with Go course are both free ones with the goal being, you know, when people are learning, they just need some resources to get going. The web development and the testing course are both paid. And the, the sort of thinking there is, well, one, I've got to pay the bills and have some way of, you know, actually making money to, to do all these things. But the uh, second part of it is that they really cut down on the amount of time you'd have to spend trying to learn all that stuff on your own. And I know this because I went through the process myself of learning how to build web apps with Go and learning all this different stuff. And I was kind of, I was trying to take like what took hundreds of hours to learn and sort of distilling it down into like, here's 40 hours that will really get you up and running. So my wife's in a boot camp right now for web development you know, the JavaScript, HTML, CSS, all the stuff I really love. <laughs> but I, um, you know, these boot camps kind of promise that you're ready for the workforce and they do run you through. It's an intensive course. I, I do believe that at least this one, that when she's done, she, she could be very much a junior entry-level developer and be productive. 
problem is I don't really want her doing web dev. I want her to start learning Go because I think even in today's uh, climate, and right now it's February 2023, um, there's just still more job opportunities in Go than it is in, in JavaScript front end development. At least I've been looking because I also have a cousin, a cousin, I'm sorry, a nephew who went through the boot camp and is struggling to even get interviews. So I told her that when she's done with this boot camp, which is almost like two and a half months, I wanted to start learning Go. And I've been thinking like, what projects am I going to have her sort of work on to build up to that? So now it's like, I'm going to have her do your gopher sizes to start so I can have her do those things and do code reviews with her. And um, I'll give you feedback once we, we're probably going to start that in March. Because I'm, uh, I'm planning on updating gopher sizes at some point because when I created it, like Go modules didn't exist. There was a bunch of things that didn't exist. And while most of the code is, you know, Go doesn't break code all the time like a lot of other languages. So that's awesome. Most of the code still works perfectly fine. But it's one of those things where when you're new and you don't understand the tooling that well, I I'd like to you know, improve some of those things. <clears throat> Plus, it's one of those things where like, as you sort of grow as a developer and a teacher, I feel like you you understand better ways of teaching stuff. And I'm sure you've seen this, you know, doing all of your um, training services that you do, that the first time you build something, it's never going to be the best version of it. So you see all these ways you could improve it. And you're like, I really want to fix those. So if you have feedback, I'd definitely love to hear it so I can make that better. I mean, it took me five, uh, maybe six years to solidify the ultimate go material to the point where I just don't need to touch it at all anymore. In fact, I'm so burnt out teaching that live for six years. I just tell people I can't do it anymore. Like you got to watch it on video. I, I put that on video, but to your point, um, I, that material doesn't have to change. People sometimes come to me and say, Bill, that that's like three years old. So can't be like valuable anymore. And I'm like, you don't understand the backwards compatibility promise um, that Go has not just said they would do, but have, have um, been true to. And that material is just as good as it was you know, like four or five years ago. So don't, it's weird as a teacher because you get that question. You're like, wow, this is all, I can't be getting. No, actually, uh, yeah, no, it's, what about the new stuff? Well, I mean, other than generics, there really isn't anything new from a language spec perspective that, uh, that that changes this. Yeah, I mean, like every once in a while, there's a small feature where you're like, that'd be cool to add. Um, an example of that is um, embedding. When, I've embe when embedding came out and you're dealing with templates, it's like, okay, it'd be cool to embed these templates. But you could also do that with third-party libraries. So it wasn't impossible before. It just wasn't in the standard library. So... But yeah, to your point, I get that question all the time. And it's it's especially funny because people will either watch some of the videos or they'll watch samples and they'll watch like five hours worth of video. And they'll be like, hey, but this is out of, I loved it, but it's out of date. And you're like, well, what part of the sample is out of date? And they're like, well, nothing there. But I just assume that since you haven't updated it in this much time, I'm like <laughs> you've just seen that all of that still works perfectly. Like, I guess it's just <laughs> training know. from all the other languages and frameworks that are like, we've got to release something new and breaking every year. And Go just doesn't do that, which is awesome. So, you know, it's funny. And it's just, we have a list here at Arden called the backlog, which I just call it the death list, to be honest with you, because anything that lands there is dead. I wanted the uh, video editing group to basically take all the raw video of Ultimate Go and just re-edit it, just so we could publish it up and say, hey, look, we're up, we've updated this thing and it's going to be the same video, man. It's just going to edit a little differently. So it feels and looks a little different, but I don't have to change it, you know, but maybe you got to play that game a little bit. So the perception is that you've, you've updated it. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> it's also hard because I don't think people realize how much effort goes into recording stuff. Like for every minute you see on screen could have been 10 hours of prep work, getting that all working. And it doesn't feel like it. But at the same time, it's just there's so much work to make that all like just that good. So I'm at the point now where I just don't have time to go in the studio and record something at that sort of level because that would be two weeks of like full time where I just don't have two weeks to it's just impossible. So what I'm doing now is I'm recording my live classes. If I have a corporate training, I record that. Um, 
and we're editing that and putting it on the education platform as the as the next version of of say a class especially mm -hmm. if i if i changed a lot in between the the other one or i like the way i taught this one better than the last time so let's and it's a like the, kill the two birds with one stone kind of thing now some people may not like it because they're like phil this isn't like structured educational this 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 and i'm like i get it but i just don't have time to do that and i want to share this new material with you so I'm going to put you in a live classroom, essentially. That's where I'm kind of at. And we're doing that with all the trainers. Let's, we're going to put everybody as if they were in that live class. And we're available for questions. And, I, and that's leads me. My other question to you is, I've never seen you do a live class or at a conference or, or anything like that. I know you've been busy, but I would love to see you, at least in a bare minimum, do some conference workshops, even if it's four hours. And I, you know, that's where I've really been able to grow my business. You know, I, and I, I'd love to see you do that. So I went to Gotham go once and gave a talk. That's, that's about the only thing I've really done. And part of this is because I live in this really small town in Pennsylvania. So there's no conferences or meetups nearby, which I think I'm probably the only developer that lives in the town I'm in. Um, so like when I tell people I'm a software developer, they're like, can you fix my Google spreadsheets or something? And I'm like, no, that's <laughs> not what I do. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I'd love to do that stuff more, especially when the kids are older part. Like there's a couple reasons there. One of them is travel is just kind of tricky because the nearest airport for me is like two hours away. So you take that into consideration with trying to fly somewhere. It means that I've got to leave two hours before I need to check into my flight. Plus a little bit of wiggle room in case there's any sort of traffic. And then whatever flight time there is getting out to a place. So it just, it ends up burning a whole day, which is exhausting. And my wife doesn't love being at home alone, especially now that we've got two kids. So just small things like that. Whereas New York worked a lot better because I could hop on a train and take it from where I was through Philly up to New York. And that was a lot nicer and easier. And my wife actually came with me on that trip. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I, the other part of it, which is going to sound weird, is I'm kind of weird about speaking in front of people. Like it's like something I have not done a lot and it's very nerve wracking for me, which is odd because I do all these courses where I'm talking to myself in the camera and I go do go time and I do all this stuff where I'm like kind of speaking in public, but I don't see the audience. So it's not as terrifying. So that's something I kind of have to like work up to and, you know, get over myself. It's all practice. Like all I did was live training. So when it came time to do some of my first recordings, I was told by a producer at the time, practice by staring at yourself in the mirror and talking. So you could stare exactly at the camera lens the whole time. And I was like, dude, that's like crazy, right? Now it's natural for me to just stare at a camera lens deep into it and talk. But it's like anything, John, it's just going to be practice. And I don't care what anybody says, right? I've talked in front of people for a decade. There's that moment when you first start that it's nerve wracking and you're nervous and you want to throw up uh, and you got to get for past the first two minutes. So I tell everybody this sort of trick. If it's a stage talk, which I hate the most, get on stage at least two minutes before you have to talk to get through that moment. And then if it's a workshop, it's an on off sort of thing. When you're out of the room, you're off, but when you're in the room, you're on. So don't go into the room until you're ready to be on, but try to also greet people so you can be, sort of on before you start. These are dumb little tricks, right? But I think you're going to be great if you can get you in front of some people. Every little bit helps. It's something that I'd like to do more in the future, but it just, it hasn't happened. It, it'd be cool to, the other part with that too, is that when I started considering it more was kind of around the time COVID kicked in and then all of a sudden there's not really a lot going on. And now I haven't, now that conferences and stuff are happening more, I haven't really given it much thought, but that's partially because we have a 10 month old at home. So I don't think you give extra thought to travel or anything else when you have a young baby at home that's just exhausting all around. But but to be fair, all of my corporate training is all over Zoom at this point still, which is a bummer. Like the only live training I'm doing is conferences, so I love that. But companies haven't gone back to the office. I don't think they're going back to the office. Um not the way it was where you had to move there, right? Like so this is going to be the life of training. It's interesting hearing you say that because I swear it was, um, I, I talked to somebody else who does training like you do, they go to co corporate offices and do that type of stuff. 
And I think they were kind of the opposite. They had been trying to do this online type training because they didn't like the travel days and all that stuff. And when, when COVID kicked in, they started getting a lot more bookings like that. And now they're like, we don't want to go back. It's so great not having to spend that much time traveling. And you're the opposite where you're like, I want to go into that office and I want to see the people I'm teaching and I want to like see the reactions. So it's, it's, I think we need both. So I don't think that it's a bad thing, but I could totally get both sides of it. It's just interesting that you're the opposite of like other people I've talked to. Did I treat training as, as entertainment? You're not there just to regurgitate. You have to keep people's focus. You have to keep people's attention. And I feed off the energy. So if I'm doing a Zoom training for 40 people, if I can get five people to keep their cameras on all day, like that's a blessing actually. And I just teach to those people with the camera on. Um, and if I don't see they're engaged, my energy levels are gonna go down. If I'm in a room, I got all that energy, man. I feed off of it. and People are exhausted at the end of one of my workshops and they, they can't understand why. And I'm like, cause I drained you. Like I took all of your energy for the last eight hours. Just keep mine up. I, I get it. But you could do that. I mean, I, I think you could do the. I think that type of workshop I'd be way more comfortable with. It's the big stages that I think I could get there, but I think I'd really have to like get my talk down to the point where I don't want it to be like, you know, memorized. Cause that's just not a good talk usually. But I want it to be to the point where like I know exactly what I'm talking about. Whereas with some of the stuff I do, it's it's a little bit I can let myself I don't want to say wander, but like I can let it go wherever it naturally goes. And that's OK, because I know I can like edit clips and do things like that to you know, get it where it needs to be. So it's just, uh, I guess, a little bit more nerve wracking in that sense. But I definitely like the idea of in-person stuff, because like that's where I met Matt Ryer for the first time. And now I do go time with him and everything. And he's an awesome guy. So like it's nice to meet people and do those things that I otherwise would never get the chance to do. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna jump into the time machine now and we'll get back to some of this at the end of the show. So first question I wanna ask you is what year did you graduate from um, high school and where, where were you on the, you know, on the planet basically that, that year? I didn't know this was gonna have trick or tricky questions like this. I think it was 2005 <laughs> is when I graduated high school and I was in a okay. town in Pennsylvania, a small town called Bedford. You're in, oh, in Bedford. I've heard of Bedford. I mean, I grew up on Long Island in New York. My Pennsylvania experience was the Poconos, right? My parents thought it would be fun to get a timeshare in the Poconos. So we'd have a place to go every, for one week a year. Uh, I don't know. It didn't work out that way for me. I, I didn't mind going, but it wasn't I didn't look forward to it necessarily every year, but yeah, okay. So that's Pocono. So, but you're in Bedford. Um, okay, in 2005. Okay, cool. That just gives us a, a general idea of what tech tech was like. So, here's my very first favorite question. Don't think too hard. Okay, just first thought that pops in your head. Give me that first memory you have of working on a computer, where it felt kind of magical to you, or you were able to do something that was like, wow. I, I want to say it was like maybe third or fourth grade. I happened to have this teacher who had an Apple basic computer in her classroom. And I don't know how we got into it. I think she was trying to teach us Spanish and none of us really cared about it at the time. And this wasn't like a, it wasn't a normal classroom. It was like a, it's some weird program the school had where some of us got out of class to go do extra stuff. And we somehow started doing like basic programming and somebody had a floppy disk, like the actual ones that are floppy. I don't know what they're called, but um, had one of those and plugged it in that had their older siblings code. And it was like this pixelated blimp that kind of went across the screen. And then we realized that we could look at the source code and actually change things on this that, you know, like how it was drawing the, the image on the screen and everything. And we didn't know what we were doing. So like we broke the code, did all sorts of dumb stuff, but just seeing that you could actually, you know, tell the computer what to do was really mind boggling. And then because we were young, for whatever reason, we were fascinated with this idea of like setting up an infinite for loop and having it print out the numbers and then like secretly keeping the computer on at night and then coming back the next day to see how high it had counted. So like silly things like that are what stick in my head is like when I first started to like see programming and really like think it was cool. Okay. And that's like second, third grade, you said. So you, I think it was third or fourth that... grade, but I'm not positive. But that's fine. I mean, that around that age, which puts you at about like eight, nine sort of years old, maybe 10, 
where you're realizing that like you can control and manipulate this computer uh, with, if you make these changes to this text or, or all that kind of stuff. And it seems like you had that impression, so that was kind of fascinating to you. But after that moment, does that sort of stick with you or was it, it was just that moment and, and you moved on? So it stuck with us for a little bit because the teacher saw we were interested and she started teaching us some programming stuff. And I remember doing a couple things like um, you could set up the disk to run a program whenever you stuck it in. So we all like made passwords essentially for our programs. Well, then we all realized that you could press control C, I think it was control C to just stop the program on these old Apple computers. So we're all like, oh, we can crack your password protection now. And we basically just did all sorts of stuff trying to like see if we could stop that from happening. But I don't think any of us actually figured out a good way of doing it because we're all very young, no idea what we're doing. Um, but it was just cool seeing stuff like that. And then I, I sort of dabbled with it a little bit, but I didn't really progress any at all for the next couple years. And it wasn't until I played this game called Grail, which was like a Zelda, like if you've ever played the, I think it's the Super Nintendo Zelda Link to the Past. It was kind of like a ripoff of that game, but it was an online version of it. And it had this level editor that you could jump into to like design your own worlds or stories. And the only way you could actually do a story that like was entertaining was to actually get into the scripting part of it where you'd actually script the different NPCs and stuff in the game. So I think that's where I kind of started diving back into programming again was when I realized like I can build these really cool like worlds in this game and not just have to play what they have for me. So I started learning some basic stuff with that. And then after that, I think the next step that got me into web development stuff was um, trying to share that. So like you'd, you'd build some level and it was terrible because I was young at the time, but I'd want to share it with the world. And I'm like, well, how do I do this? So then I somehow managed to meet some other people who were doing similar things and started learning all this web development stuff where you're like taking an image, chopping it up in like uh, maybe MS Paint or something and then trying to put it in tables to design a web page and then putting the levels that you had up on this web page. And thinking back on it now, it's kind of interesting because I was young, like maybe 11 or 12 or something at the time. And I'm talking with people who are adults and I don't think they realize that they're talking to like a young kid. And now they might be kind of weird about that. Like, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. But at the time, I just never said anything. And there's like, ah, it's somebody who's developing stuff. Cool. I'll help them out. What were you talking? Where were you chatting on like an R? An R I don't remember. That, IRC or something? It might have been IRC because I know I used IRC. I used Yahoo or not. Was it, it wasn't Yahoo. It was AOL Messenger. So you're in basically junior high school, online connected, trying to build a website, and you're talking to let's just say strangers. I, I mean, strangers on the you internet. must have been in a, strangers on the internet in some forum or group that knew how to write. You must have found these people in some. I don't. I don't remember how I found them. I know the one person was somebody I met in game somehow, and I don't even know how that happened. And. Like we both like designing web pages and stuff. And I don't think he found out until way, way later. Like when I graduated high school and Facebook came out, I think he added me as a friend on Facebook. And I think that might've been when he kind of like, oh, this is, he's really young. Um, but freaked out. Oh my God. I, he wasn't freaked out. Because <laughs> at that point, like I was over 18. It was like, all right. But it was just, uh, <laughs> I think that's just how it happened. I mean, it's not a crime talking to an 11 year old if you're talking the way you guys were talking. I mean, it's. I, I could just imagine it where, like, if my parents knew that I was up till 2 a.m. talking with some stranger on the Internet, like, that sounds bad at, you know, at thinking about it that way. But in reality, I'm sitting there, like, up till 2 programming, which was not what you'd really expect from a teenage boy. Yeah, I mean, and we're talking probably 1999, 19, I mean, mid to late 90s, too. So the Internet is still very new. I didn't see the internet for the first time until like 1995 or 96 or something. I, I remember that moment walking into somebody's office and had a browser up and I'm like, what's that? And he's like, I'm connected to the internet. I go, you're connected to what? He's like, yeah, I'm connected to the internet. And I like, even at that moment, I had no idea what he was even what talking about. <laughs> and, and when he explained it, my mind kind of just exploded. Right. I mean, even that's like 95, 96. So, we didn't know necessarily any better either that people were going to, I mean, we should have known, but people were going to be immoral and unethical at the same time. People are really helping each other, right? It's the good and the bad. 
Yeah. I mean, it's nice because I've seen the good in people and like how cool that is to build that community, even when it wasn't easy to do it. So I, I think there's a lot of good people out there. It's just, unfortunately, we hear about the bad cases and we don't want that to happen. So we sort of prevent kids from accessing the, the good stuff. I always say, you know, people ruin, like individuals ruin it for everybody all the time. Right? Yep. <laughs> okay. So, so this is interesting because even in junior high school, you're, you're already starting to build out websites to share this content, electronic content, right? That you're building for these games. So a couple of things then. So as you, as you enter high school, I imagine that this, the computer's cool. You're doing that, right? Even me in junior high school, in the beginning of high school, I was spending a lot of time at home programming, but it wasn't my entire life. Like I had a life at school as well. Like what other things were you doing um, as you entered high school? Sports, music? Uh, I played soccer a lot. So that was probably most of my life. Um, I, so I played soccer so I played on an indoor team, I played on a club team, and then I played on the high school team. So I was basically on a soccer team all year round. Oh, you got you were that good. I mean, you, you got on a club team. So I I wouldn't say I was that good. I was for my area of not a lot of people. I was I I, I was decent. I think one of the things that helped me was that I was fast and I worked really hard at it. So like my club team, I think I was the worst player on my club team. But like I think my coach liked me because there were games where we'd be losing. And he'd be like, if you'd all work as hard as John's working right now, we'd be doing better. Whereas everybody else has kind of given up. And like, because I knew I was worse, I just didn't give up as much. So like, if I'd lose the ball, I'd run back to try to get it. Whereas other people might just kind of be like, well, I lost it and like kind of jog back. So I wasn't like the most amazing at soccer by any stretch, but I was good enough to make those teams, but just barely good enough. But I still enjoyed playing it, helped me stay in shape. Let me ask you a question. My sister lives in a city in Bedford County called Ilmer. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, I-M-L-E-R. Imler? Have you heard of that that town, Imler? Is that what it's called? Is it in Pennsylvania? Have it's you heard of that? in Pennsylvania, then yeah, I believe I know where that is. Yeah, my sister bought a house there like a couple years ago. Um, this is middle of nowhere, but I think she's only an hour away from like the Allentown Airport or anything. The reason I'm bringing it up, other than the fact that you said you lived in Bedford. I didn't know if you guys were close. Um, she's got three kids who are into both the karate stuff and the gymnastics. And they're, dude, they're like kicking butt every single weekend. They're, they're placing at least second, third, or first in like all these tournaments out there. But I never got the impression that it was they were only competing in that small little town. I mean, I still imagine, even though you say, well, it was a small town, you still had to compete against regional schools. I'm sure there were some schools that were fairly large around you. I guess the way I'd put it was I was never going to make a college team, but for the area and everything, I, I did pretty decent. I was a pretty good player in that sense. So I don't mean to like, I guess it just kind of depends on how you put it. Like I, I knew I wasn't going to do this professionally, but it was something I really enjoyed doing. No, it's awesome. So you had you had soccer. So when you weren't at school and playing soccer and you were at home, sort of even all throughout high school, did that progress? Did the tech you were building progress throughout high school? Um, it did some. Like I remember the one thing I really wanted to do for the longest time was I wanted to let people email me for whatever reason. Um, I would like to give me feedback on levels or whatever whenever I was like messing with the game stuff. So I know that's what got me into PHP for the first time was I was like, I want to set up just a simple mail form that they could submit. And for whatever reason, I remember at the time it was really hard to find a free host that also had like the SMTP servers and stuff set up to do all that. Um, and you know, me being like 12, 13, whatever, it's not like I had a credit card to go pay for hosting somewhere. And I don't, my parents might've thought I was crazy if I wanted to do that. Um, <laughs> so I, I remember getting into PHP from that stuff and learning some of it. And I was also really lucky in the sense that my dad's an engineer. My older brother had dabbled in programming. Um, one of the friends that I knew from whenever we first started looking at programming, his older sibling had programmed. So I had access to people who had messed with this stuff in the past who I could ask questions of and um, learn from. And then in high school, there was some programming classes in high school that did like Java and maybe C. 
And I remember taking those, but I, I kind of hit a wall where like we were just learning the introductory stuff, like hello world, basic for loops and things like that, but we never like got into anything beyond that. So it it wasn't that I like didn't care about programming. It was more just like I didn't really know how to get past where I was. Um but I still knew that's something I wanted to do. Like, I think all through middle school and all through high school, I think I had to do like, you know, those job career type research papers. And I wanted to be a webmaster, I think is what it was called at the time. Whatever that you know, the role was, it changed over time. But like, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So like, I've been lucky enough to know almost my entire life what I wanted to do. And that made like prepping for college and all that other stuff so much easier. Cause I'm like, these are the things that I, I want to actually do for, for a living. And it probably also helped that it was a field that paid well. So like my parents and everybody were very supportive of that. Your dad being an engineer then, uh, and you having siblings, how many computers did you end up having in the house? Did you have to compete for time with that computer? Was it in a family room? Did you ever get it in your room? Kind of curious about that. We had, it, it started with my dad's computer in his office. So I'd have to like get access to it whenever he wasn't using it for whatever reason. Um, he had like a home office with the computer, but he went to an office to work. So it's not like he was using it through the day. So a lot of times I'd get home from school and my brothers and I would go use the computer to play like Wolfenstein 3D and, and to do different stuff on it. Um, at some point, I don't remember when, I, I kept asking for a computer and my parents got me this old, I think it was like E-Machines was the brand. They got me this old E-Machines. Oh yeah, like, e -Machines, They got me like an yeah. E-Machines computer for Christmas, I think is what it was. And it was nothing amazing by any stretch, but it was awesome to have my own computer at that point. So then I started, you know, diving into a lot more stuff. I played games a lot too, which kept me very distracted. But it also weirdly taught me some stuff. Like I remember, I think it was Quake Online. It was one of those old first-person shooters. But like to play online, there weren't, it wasn't always easy to connect to different servers, especially if you wanted to like go to custom servers. So you had, to, I don't even remember how I did it, but you'd find IP addresses for servers to connect to. And then you'd, you know, connect to them in the game through the, like the console in the game. And like, so I started doing stuff like that. And like, to this day, I'm like, I don't know how I learned that because I don't think you can just stumble across it, but I had to have figured it out somehow. I remember at that time, like CompuServe, you were either on AOL or CompuServe to find things and to talk. I would download drivers when I needed them. From, like that was the most amazing thing for me um, in and around the early nineties was like, I need a driver. I don't have a floppy disk for it. I'm done. Let me jump on CompuServe and see if some company was nice enough to like upload. So I, my my guess is either AOL or CompuServe for you at the time or something similar. You must have been talking or connected to you to find these things. You kind of already said, you know, like you knew that as you got finished with high school, you wanted to go to university and study computer science. But I also heard you say that you were really more interested in the web development side of things and not so much the, I'll call it the structured programming side of things, right? Like that visual, my guess is it had a visual aspect to it and had an instant feedback to it. And it was cool because you could share that as opposed to, hey, write me a linked list right now and, and C it was like, great, I did it, but where's the value in that? I don't know if I'd say it's that I was more interested. It was just like, that's what I was exposed to. So that's all I really knew. And I know like whenever I did a job research paper and said webmaster is what I'm going to be, it was because I didn't know, like, I didn't know any other things existed. I was like, this is the one that I've found and I know it involves programming. So that's what I'm going to go for. And whenever I finally started looking at universities and I saw that, okay, it looks like any of these jobs require a computer science degree. So I started looking at computer science and it probably wasn't until I want to say my first or second year at college, whenever I took a programming class that actually started introducing sorting algorithms that I started to realize like what could be done on the back end of computers. And I really fell in love with that type of the algorithms and data structures, not like, as I said before, I didn't love the math part behind it, but I loved like watching visuals visualizations of how sorting algorithms worked and really understanding all of these algorithms that people came up with to do things way quicker than you know, just that naive bubble sort or whatever other type of sort you might come up with. And I really fell in love with that stuff in college. So I was, I was lucky enough to get exposed to it all. 
Um, and that kind of really directed where my career ended up going. But if it hadn't been for that, I don't. Okay, but don't don't jump that far. Don't don't jump that far yet, because I, I really want to talk about the, the the choices you're making going from high school into university, right? Like you, you decided you wanted to, to be a software developer. You were focused on the web. So what were your options at the time? Were you looking to get away? Were you looking to stay closer to home? Were there's a particular school that had what you wanted? I did not want to go to school at home. Penn State has campuses all across Pennsylvania. And my parents, I think, wanted me to go to Penn State because even their main campus at State College was like an hour away. Um, I very adamantly did not want to go to a school nearby um, to the point that whenever I applied for universities, I only applied to schools in California and Florida, um, like nowhere near close. And I got accepted <laughs> to several of them. And then sort of towards the very end of me selecting a college, my parents were like, well, maybe you should just pick one school close just in case. And I'm like, all right, fine. I'll apply to Penn State as well. So I applied to Penn State very, very late. And basically the way their acceptance works is I think based on my criteria, I would have been accepted to State College, their main campus. But because I'd applied so late, I ended up getting accepted to their branch campus that was in Altoona, Pennsylvania, which was like a half hour away. And I don't remember how it ended up happening, but I could tell my parents weren't super thrilled about me going to California where like if something went wrong, like they can't just come help me. It's like, that's a long flight to get there. So I think I somehow caved and was like, all right, fine, I'll start here and see how it goes and then sort of go from there. And that- So they were putting that kind of pressure on you to-, it, it, to... It's, it's hard to call it pressure. It was more like I could tell, but at the same time, they were kind of like, we're not gonna force you to do anything, like it's your decision, but like you pick what you want. And I think maybe I took their opinion a lot because so my parents um, helped pay for or basically paid for almost all of my college um, with a few exceptions of like some small scholarships and stuff. They paid for everything. So I was very lucky in that sense, but I also like was trying to take what they wanted into consideration because I know that's, you know, a huge gift to give to your kids. I wonder, I, I wonder this because they live in such a rural area. And I don't know your parents, but was it somewhat like the idea of the urban city would have just stressed them out too much for you to be there because they're kind of brought up in this rural area? Like, I think if I went to Pittsburgh, they would have been fine. The issue was they didn't want me so far away that, like, if something went wrong, they couldn't help. And even Florida was more appealing to them because they're like, we don't want to do it, but if we have to drive 18 hours to get there, we can. Whereas, like, California, they're like, we can't drive that in a day. We have to get a flight. There's no other way to get out there. It's going to take some time. Right, because they're not even close to an airport. Where I would have, I could almost make an argument that I could get to California faster than I can drive 18 hours anywhere else, right? Like, I could make that argument. I mean, I should also add the caveat that my dad is really weird about flying now. Um, he used to do, like, um, different types of missions work in other countries, and he taught English in other countries. He actually went to, I think, China and taught English for an entire summer whenever I was in middle school or high school. And I know he's had some kind of scary flight situations where they just freaked him out and he doesn't like flying anymore. So I, I think that might have also played a role in his thinking as far as, like, which one's easier to get to. That's super interesting, dude, because... I lived in an airplane for like three years before the pandemic hit. And I had one really scary moment. I didn't think I was going to die, but it was scary. But I had one moment where I thought it was all over. I, I thought, that's it. It's over. And the pilot of the plane was magnificent, right? I don't have time to go into that story. But, but even at that moment where I thought it was over, okay, the plane turned around, thought it was over. Uh, I was on the plane again, like two hours later, no worries, no issues. Like I, my dad had the same experience flying into Chicago one time. It was the plane must have been all over the place and he never ever got in. He got home and he never got into a plane again. So I guess it happens to people. OK, so you decide you're going to go to Penn State. You're not going to be main campus, but you're going to be at least an hour away anyway. Checks off those boxes. You go to university, and I always like talking about that first year of your computer science sort of program because it can 
it can go two ways. It could be super boring for you to the point where you just you lose interest or it's super challenging for you and you kind of lose interest. It sounds to me like it got you more excited than anything else that first year of classes. Um, <laughs> well, the first year is a bad um, is a bad one to look at because I, for whatever reason, I decided to go to Penn State, but I didn't really want to be there. And it was also so close to where I grew up that it was almost like I was still in high school. Like it was still a lot of the same people were around and I didn't like that. So I kind of fell into like bad habits of just partying with old friends and doing stupid stuff. And I also played World of Warcraft a lot at the time. And I, I guess the best way to put it would be I didn't like fail out or drop out, but I got bad enough grades on classes that I shouldn't have had. Like I was barely passing um, calculus. But I had tested out of calculus because I took AP calculus in high school. So like I didn't even have to take the class. It was supposed to be an easy A and I had a C in the class. So my parents are like, um, why do you have a C in this class? Well, the reason I had a C was because <laughs> I only showed up for tests. I didn't take any of the quizzes or anything. And when all you do is take the tests, your, your grade goes down a good bit. So my first year was, um, it was kind of like the first semester went through and I got most of my credits. I think I dropped out of one class and then my second semester, it was, I dropped out of like two more classes. And at the end of it, I hadn't like failed any classes, but I had less credits than I should have. My parents could tell that like, hey, you're not like taking this seriously. This is not gonna work long-term. Um, so I ended up taking the next summer and the next fall semester at least off. And I went and got a full-time job. And I basically tried to decide like what my next steps were going to be like, you know, cause I clearly was not enjoying what I was doing there. Um, and what essentially ended up happening was I talked to my parents and I just said, like, I cannot go to school this close to where I grew up. Like I need, like college needs to be something new for me. Like I need a fresh break. I need new people. And at that point, I think they kind of realized that, that me going someplace close was not the best choice. So I ended up going to university of central Florida in Orlando. UCF. Yes. Yep. Yeah, UCF. You're, wow. My, uh, my kids, my oldest went there and graduated. And another, well, number two went to Valencia for nursing. But um, yeah, UCF, that's a, a dude. That's like the, the second largest uh, university in the country. I think there's like 60,000 students there. Yeah, there's there's a ton of people there, but so many of them commute that it's like the parking lots are insane there. So when my daughter went to school there in, oh my God, I don't know what year she went there. Um, I felt it was quite the opposite. I felt like there were a lot more, maybe at that time now, a lot more people live on campus or live. You know what it is? I don't think it's commuting. Like you don't live in the dorms. Like she lived in the dorm the first year because I wanted her to do that. And then she lived off campus. So I don't know if it's commuting as much as people living off campus. Uh, you'd have to ask her, but I know <clears throat> when I went, in every class I'd be in, at least, I feel like at least 25% of the people lived like with their parents or somewhere within like, it was always within like an hour, but they would drive that distance to class. You're right, there's a lot of kids who lived off campus, so that definitely was a factor too. But I, I, I think the other thing is just the school has so many people that even the number that live on campus or right near campus is still massive compared to a lot of other universities. I just remember parking wise, there was this one parking lot that was way off in the distance near their intramural soccer fields. And I knew nobody ever parked there and I had a longboard, a skateboard. So I would always go drive there and park and then ride my skateboard to class because that took less time than going to a parking garage and trying to find a parking spot for 20 minutes. I believe that's where they have that little, that's where the, all the, the sports complex is and the little, well now at least today, they've got like restaurants over there or something. Oh, there were not restaurants that I recall, but. <laughs> Um, I know there's like a couple of turf soccer fields in the area and I knew about them cause I played soccer a lot, like pickup games and things like that. Nice dude. I, and yeah, my daughter had a great, great experience there. So it's a big school. A lot of people from Florida in fact now, I mean, they're moving to the big 12. I think it is big 10 or big 12 that they're, they're going to get out of, the, um, their dinky little conference dude. That, that school's, that school's, I mean, it's getting it's, big it's there. Coming it's, along. And, yeah. um, I mean, I was also lucky because I think as far as me and my career goes, going there was by far a better, like it, it led to a much better trajectory, I think. 
Um, because that's where I learned about, like, they had a programming team. So I first got introduced to that stuff. Um, their computer science department, in my opinion, has gotten really good over time um, and, you know, gotten really good in that sense. Um, but on top of that, the, the the programming team type stuff has also gotten really good to the point where when I was there, they were kind of just starting to to level up is how I'd put it. But now, if, if I understand correctly, the last few times they've gone to like world um, finals for these programming competitions, they're actually placing very high. And like usually they're like one of the top two U.S. schools. So like they're doing really well with that stuff. And it's cool to see that. But I, it's also like I look at it now and I'm like, would I have made the team if I was there now versus like when I was there? No, I don't think you can ask that question. But let me two things, two things. I'm a, did you end up graduating from UCF? And then, OK, what prevented you from falling back into those same habits? Just the fact that you didn't have your uh, your old crowd with you or was the the people you were meeting were different and you just were able to kind of change your habits? I would say one of the things that helped. So like all through high school, I didn't really have to study much. So then I went to Penn State and I was taking all sort of like the entry level classes. And because I like and I said, like I was in calculus, but I'd already tested out of it. So I knew all the material already. So I didn't really have to go to class to pass those tests. And as a result, I ended up just doing other stuff. And part of it was like I had an old crowd, so I didn't have to go to class to meet people. I could just go party with people I knew, do whatever. And it was a bunch of dumb young teenager decisions. And then when I went to UCF, I, I think I knew one person in the area. So if I wanted to make friends or do anything, I had to go to class. And once I sort of was in that habit of going to class every day, um, and I was also taking some more challenging programming classes at the time. So all of that sort of forced me to need to go to class for one reason or another, whether it was to meet people to hang out with, or if it was to you know actually pass the class material and everything. Um, and I think once I got into that habit, it was a lot better, but, um, I mean, I was by no means the best student ever by any stretch, but I think that got me off to a good start. And I, I would guess the other part of it was, I said, I took some time off between going to state or Penn state and coming to this school. And I worked a full-time job at a, it was like this plant that makes carbon fiber, like beams and stuff. And I did this through the night shift, um, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. And it was miserable work. And on top of that, you'd come home like itching like carbon fiber for like the next four hours. And all your, like you had to keep your clothes separate because those clothes were just, they always felt like they had carbon fiber fibers in them. You didn't have like a suit, one of those, those suits you could just wrap your body around. I forgot what they call them when they're, uh, I would have bought one. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't really know any better at the time. So it, it was one of those things where, I think working that job also helped me be like, well, I definitely don't want to do this. Like, this is not something that I want to do for the rest of my life. I really like that programming thing. I want to make that happen. So that probably also helped motivate me to be like, don't screw this up. Make sure you're actually learning the stuff you need to. Um, so just a bunch of small things like that. But I, I will definitely say that for my kids, when they go off to school, I will encourage them to go someplace a little bit farther away because I think it is nice to get that fresh start because High school is okay in some ways, but I feel like there's a lot of bad with high school and like having a break from those kids and like building new relationships that aren't based on like I, I, high schools. I feel like friendships and everything are just based on weird things and what people care about is just as an adult, you look back and you're like, why did I care about that stuff? But as a kid, it was the world to you. So like three, three things pop in my head um, from all of that. One, I made sure all my kids were at least three hours away because I told them if you're not, then you're going to still be asked by your parents to do things because you're close. So go far away. That way you're truly independent. You're not so far where we can't get to you, like your parents said, but you're not too close where I can't ask you to go pick up something because I'm busy. The fiber thing. Oh my God, dude. One of my first jobs in high school that I got, was working in a Chinese restaurant as a dishwasher. And I would come home smelling like an egg roll, man, every night. I couldn't get the smell of Chinese food. And this was a fancy Chinese restaurant, like, but every plate came in full. I, this, my brain at some point was just like, do people like not enjoy this food that I don't have one plate to clean? 
and I used to get yelled at, dude. I used to get yelled at because I wasn't moving fast enough to the point where I'd have to just use my hands to like take large amounts of food off of plates to wash them. So like your fiber thing was like my Chinese food, like, oh my God, it was horrible. I, I don't I don't think I worked there more than two months. Um, and I can't remember the other memory I had <laughs> on the other thing, but um, dude, yeah, it's interesting, man. It's And oh, here it is, here it is. My son decided he didn't want to go to college. He's 20 right now. And he tells me yesterday, a couple of days ago, he's like, dad, I had to like hand scrub all the floors. And he works for my sister in, in, in some of her restaurants. He's like, and I always talk to like, when he talks, this is his voice for me. Like dad. Oh man. So, uh, I had to like hand wash all the floors yesterday to get them clean. And I looked at, and I just said to him, dude, that, this is what happens when you don't go get an education. You're going to be on your hands and knees scrubbing floors. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. So you're going to go sign up for college? Yeah, yeah, dad. <laughs> of course, right? You know, he's not going to do that. Um, but it's that point you made, like, like you, you, you work this job, you went every day, you were responsible, you did it. But you just realized that if you didn't go and get some form of education, it doesn't have to be college. If you didn't get some form of education, like this is potentially what your life was going to be for another three, four, five years, right? I guess after that experience, I definitely feel like with my kids, I want to make sure they're working jobs throughout high school and that sort of thing. Because I worked, when I turned 16, my parents were like, all right, here's a car that we have, that you like an old beater car we have, you can use it. But they're like, we're not filling it up with gas, so you need to have money to pay for gas before the tank runs out. So I got a job, I think... I applied that day and had the job the next day and I worked all through high school and everything. And I think having kids work those jobs, not because the jobs are necessarily good for them, but it's more just the like showing them what it's like to work at a restaurant or something like that. That's not that entertaining, not that great. And to, to sort of motivate them, like if you want to do something else, then you need to put in the effort, whether that's learning from an electrician or, or you know, learning some other trade, whatever it is, is fine. It's just, you need to figure out what you want that to be and do it because like, nobody's going to sort of hold your hand and, and take you to a good job. You have to work for it. The big problem though, is my first three, one, one, two, and three knew what they wanted to do getting out of high school, though that changed their, after their sort of third or in their third year of university, that all changed, but they finished their degrees, right? And that's fine and that's fair. But the two boys, number four and five, who are now like 19 and 20 and now out of high school, they have not figured out what they want to do yet. And number five experienced what you experienced, just was burnt out from high school. I got him to enroll in the community college. And for him, it was just like high school again. And he didn't tell me, but he dropped out like a month in. And I got it. Like, dude, I know. I told you, like, this is high school all over again. I told you to go away to school. He's not motivated. He's so burnt out. But I think the problem is that they haven't figured out what they want to do yet. And it's like the worst thing in the world because you're now in limbo just working jobs that are not bringing your, they're just, I don't know, dude. I, 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 they're just, ah, oh, it drives me crazy, right? But I have to imagine it's worse now because every time I hear people talking about prepping for college, it seems so much more intense than when I was in high school. Like, like they have to you be perfect at all these tests and do, do all these extra, extra, or extra curricular stuff. I can't speak today. Um, you know, they do all this stuff to try to get there. And in my mind, especially like the first two years of college, a lot of people have no idea what they really want to do. And that's one of the good things about taking all those gen ed, you know, general education classes is that you kind of get a taste of all these different things. And you can take random electives to be like, what I like doing this. So whether that's a programming class or something else, you can try to get that sense of would this be enjoyable for me. Now, the downside there is that you don't want to go two years of college and then not end up with a degree or not figure out where you're going because that is a good, you know, it's a lot of financial burden for that. But if you can, you know, in those first two years sort of figure out what you love or what you think you'd like to do, that'd be great. Um, but it is also hard. But that's the problem, John. That's the problem, right? It's The problem is that for these two boys, is that they, they're burnt out from high school. They 
do not want to sit in a classroom remote or otherwise any like so okay you need a you need a year or two off fine you go into work every day and you're being responsible i can bite my tongue and go you'll figure it out but where do you get what you just described that you're going to get for two years in university when you don't go to university where do you go to get that sort of view of all these possibilities when you're essentially stuck working at the supermarket every day or the restaurant every day and your view of the people you're meeting are also kind of everybody's in the same boat in one form or another so i i just i haven't been able to answer that question but you bring up the point that that first two years in university open your eyes to a lot of things and you get to meet a lot of people who are your peers kind of going through the same journey if you don't go to university or some formal education where do you get that that's i don't know that's the you're right that's a tough question to answer because i i don't know where you get it but i know that it can be very valuable to sort of see all those different opportunities and like see what you could potentially be but it's i, I think it's just that age is it's hard to think i need to decide at 18 what i'm doing for the rest of my life like that is mind-boggling and like i was lucky enough that i knew it was programming related i wasn't spot on as to what it ended up being programming related but I knew it was going to be something in programming and that you know gradually led to where i am now but if you had asked me when i was in college if i was going to be teaching other people programming stuff i would have been like no that's not what i'm going to be doing so it's it's kind of hard to i guess put that on somebody that young but you need it the the moment you get that the moment you figure out even if it ends up not being it because you you change your mind but the moment you figure that out everything can start to fall in place. Like everything start, and your behavior changes. Dude, I was in high school, I was, I mean, it wasn't that bad, but at the same time, like I loved going out and getting drunk with my friends. I loved getting high with my friends in high school, even a little bit in college. And when I really figured out that I wanted to work in, let's say NASA or industry, or something, I realized that those behaviors were not going to allow me to do that, right? Like they were going to start taking drug tests. I wanted an internship over the summer at Grumman Aerospace. And the first thing my dad said was, they're going to give you a drug test. And my brain went, oh my God, this sucks, right? Like, and so it, it allowed me to stop some of that behavior because I realized if I don't stop that behavior, I'm not going to get what I want. And I think it also helps with that. So it's, like I said, it like you're kind of lost and in limbo until you find that that thing. Yeah, and I can also say as far as classes go, I I know myself and probably tons of other people do better in classes for like the thing they want to do. So like for me, it was programming classes. Like my grades in those classes were significantly better than my other grades in other classes because I just really enjoyed that topic. And I think it's just finding that motivation to sort of drive you to study and do other stuff. It, it you need to find it, but I don't know how you find it necessarily. All right. So you let's just push through university at this point. You're going to graduate. You're going to graduate with this computer science degree. I'm guessing at that point it's 2010, 2009. What year is it? I want to say it was 2011, 2012. Okay. But, but I'll try it because you took the year off. That's fine. 2011, 2012. Okay, so almost like, let's just say 10 years, 10 years ago, roughly, maybe 11. It might have been 2010. I honestly don't remember. So 2010, 2011, somewhere in that ballpark. What's the next step for John? Because you're in central Florida, right? You've experienced, Orlando is really growing as a city too. I mean, uh, even t t today, Orlando is a full-fledged city as far as I'm concerned. Um, so you, you have some of that experience too, like not living in a rural area where everybody's got 10 acres between each other and like you're on top of people here. Some people can't handle that when they grow up in a more rural area, but I think you thrived. I think you enjoyed that. So what's the next step for John at that point, graduating? Well, I guess to take a step back a little bit, when I was in college, I got into the programming team stuff. Um, and along with that, I, I don't remember exactly how, but somebody who was working at Google, who was fairly high up at Google, 
had gone through UCF and was involved with the programming team in some way. Um, I don't know if they were like providing scholarships. I think that's what, and they were doing some other stuff because they wanted to see UCF's programming team like do better. And I, in that whole process of going through the programming team, at one point, the um, sort of the director of the, the whole department had reached out to all of us and said, hey, this person works at Google. If you'd like to get an interview there or to discuss some opportunities like that, um, let me know and we'll, we'll he'll at least take your resume. So I had been interning at a government contractor, um, General Dynamics. So I'd been interning there and I, I briefly worked there for, I think, six months, maybe a little bit longer full time. And I started doing a master's degree. Um, so that's also why like the years are a little bit fuzzy in my head. So I'd started a master's degree and I quickly realized like one semester in and while I was working full time doing it, that I didn't think the master's degree was necessarily what I wanted to do anymore. Um, or rather I should say it was just very challenging to do both the master's and work full time. Um, like it was kind of hard to decide. What was the work you were doing? What was the actual work you were doing? The company I was with, um, they're like a government contractor. So they get these different, um, tasks essentially from the government. And the one that I was working on was essentially they had, at some point they had like one piece of software and then it had split like three different ways for three different projects that they contracted out. And they were trying to merge them all back together as the sort of one baseline. So essentially what I was doing was I was diffing three different repositories and trying to unify them all in some way. And it was incredibly boring work because I wasn't like writing new code ever. It was just constantly just reading through old code, bit code bases and doing all this manual stuff. And like the little bit of coding I got to do that was fun was like I wrote, um, I wrote some like code to go diff the stuff and actually like tell me which files were different and like show me the parts that were different because some of the people were like manually going through every file and like, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. That's going to take forever. I'm just going to write some code that does a lot of this work for me and I can look at the important stuff. So I was doing that and I kind of was like, I don't think this is what I want to do, but I hadn't really thought too much about it. It was just, I didn't turn there and my manager was like, Hey, I can give you a full-time job if you want. And I, I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, I had a friend who had interned at Facebook and then he had actually dropped out with one year of school left, took a full-time offer at Facebook. And he was trying to convince me to come out there and apply somewhere. So whenever I got the chance, I applied at Google, Facebook, and, um, one or two small startups. And I ended up accepting an offer at Google. So I did, I think one semester's worth of master's degree. Um, you know, like it wasn't even a full load. It was like maybe six credits. And then I went off to Google to start working. That's amazing. I didn't know you worked at Google and you got that job right out of, I mean, basically right out of university. So but that means you got to move. So what office did you work out of? Uh, I was working out of Mountain View. So their, their main one. Um, yeah. Luckily, That's got to be exciting, right? I mean, I mean, think about it at the time. Google is Google, right? You get to go home and tell your parents, I'm, I just got a job at Google. And it's always sounds impressive, right? I mean, everybody's got to be super happy. My parents told me my grandfather was off golfing with people bragging about how I got into Google, like I got accepted at Google. And it, it was, it was really, it, I was really proud at the time. And I thought it was going to be like this great, I was like, I'm going to be working here for the next 10 years. It's going to be awesome. Um, so I ended up moving luckily as a college student, I didn't have anything of major value. So I sold most of my stuff. Um, and I think I had my car shipped out and flew out and that was about it. So I didn't have a lot of stuff. And yeah, then I started working at Google and I ended up on a team. It was a team that had been acquired. Um, they had like an ads project or an ads platform that kind of did some dynamic ads based on um, like an example of it, of like the type of stuff they did was like if it was raining out, maybe the ads would shift to like more umbrella type related ads versus, um, you know, showing you sunblock type ads. So it was just things that was a little more dynamic in what it was showing you. So that was a, I think they were, just, it was part of Google display ads. So the company had already written all the software and they had been acquired. So essentially what I was doing was taking their software and rewriting it into Google versions of, you know, all the stuff they use. So what languages are you using for that? Python, C? I was using Java because that's what all of their stuff was written in. So I, I had, which was good for me because I'd written a lot of Java in college. That was kind of the language I had become most familiar with at that point. 
Um, I had used C and Ruby uh, a good bit at this point. I used Python a little bit, but not a lot. Um, so, you know, I, I, was, I was using Java there. The only real downside was that I went from one rewrite of code, you know, merging stuff to another rewrite project. And if I had been smart about it, whenever I was accepting the offer at Google, you accept an offer without actually accepting a team. So then once you've accepted the offer, you kind of go through and pick a team. And me being young and sort of not really understanding this, I was thinking if I say no to this team, they might rescind my offer. So I kind of said yes to the first team I spoke to, not really thinking it through. And in retrospect, I'm like, I might have been there a lot longer had I been more particular about the team I was joining. But I ended up only being at Google for like a year and a half because the work was just kind of, it wasn't like, you know, it, it wasn't challenging, I guess. It wasn't like pushing me. It was just kind of mind-numbingly boring. But, but, but you couldn't, okay. So a couple, so we're talking like about 2012 at this time. So two, two questions from that. The one is, I'm going to throw them both at you and then you can answer them. You didn't have opportunities to switch teams at that point. And I'm kind of curious if you had met your wife yet and she moved out there with you and she's there with you or you meet, you don't tell me exactly when you meet her then if, if, if that hasn't happened yet. So technically I met my wife when I was like four years old. Um, she's, she's <laughs> from like the next town over where I grew up and I was friends with her brother. So I would go to his house after church and we'd ride four wheelers and dirt bikes. And at the time she was younger. So like, I didn't view her as like a potential dating partner in the future or anything. Cause you know, when you're, when you're 10, somebody who's seven is like, that's way too young. Um, so I, I've known her, her and her family a long time. Um, so as far as Google goes, I can say that it's not that you can't switch roles, but it's really hard to do it when you've only been on a team for a small amount of time because it's kind of hard to show why another team would want to pick you up as an engineer. Um, you know, you don't really have any like, uh, essentially you don't have any like successes to, to brag about or to show them to, to move to another team. Whenever I did leave Google, I, my manager did take me aside and he's like, if you want me to try to help you find another team, I can do that. But at the time I had started reading and looking into startups a lot more. And I really liked the idea of going to work for a small company or starting something on my own. So I was really set on like, I want to go build my own thing. And I want to, like, I'm like, I'm young. I don't have any like major barriers preventing me from doing that. So I wanted to build my own company of some sort. And at the time I was kind of. But are you leaving? Are you leaving without another job? You're just leaving? Yes, I'm leaving without another job, which terrified my parents. I'm pretty sure my mom was crying at one point about it, which was uh, kind of challenging. But you were going to stay in California or were you going to pack up and? Yes. At the time I was planning on staying in California, I wanted to work on something email related. And so I'd started building that. And my brother is also de a developer. So he was working on it with me. Well, can, let me, let me ask you this for a second. Let me, uh, uh, I'm guessing you had enough runway to pay rent and buy food for six months. Uh, mean... it was probably a year. Um, so like I should put this into context. I came from college where I saved every penny I made. Um, I, I bought food, paid rent and like played a couple games on my computer, but I didn't like spend money aside from that. So when I went to Google, I made all this money and I didn't really adjust my spending habits that much. So I just had all this money coming into my bank account and I wasn't doing anything with it. So it quickly built up and. I, in retrospect, it, I'm very lucky that I did that. You know, I'm thankful that I, I kind of stuck with that. But uh, as a result, I was able to leave and go do something else if I wanted because I had that runway. I hadn't spent the money and I was able to, to do that for a while. So my, my goal was kind of like, I want to go build this thing. I'll give myself about a year. And if it's not making any progress or having any traction, then I need to go find another job. Okay. But you had the runway. So, so. Um, nobody should have been really panicking other than you're leaving Google, which is this, <laughs> right? Like you're leaving Google after a year and a half. Yeah. I think it's also just my parents, like, it's weird. Cause like my, my grandfather 
built the company from the ground up that that my my dad works at so like he started this company but at the same time i think they kind of came from that mindset of like you don't leave a job for no other job and like you should have some sort of job and it was like kind of terrifying to think about starting a tech company with you know, with, with just going off and doing it on your own and it wasn't that they weren't supportive it was just that they didn't quite understand it and they were worried that it could be a bad decision for me so what was the idea then what was this product that you wanted to build with your brother the worst parts i don't remember fully i know it was something with email and i had a Essentially, one of the issues I ran into was that I felt like my inbox was basically my to-do list of like a bunch of things I needed to work on. And I wanted to try to unify that in a way of like um, taking emails and turning them into actionable items, essentially. And the the short and simple version was like almost just having a UI where you could click on an email that's like showing up in your thread list of emails and just overwrite what it shows as the subject to be like, go fix this thing or you know, something along those lines and easily make it like a, an actionable to do type item. And I like looking back idea. on it, it would have been very hard. I mean, I like the idea. So it, it, I don't think it's a terrible idea. It's just to make that work, you essentially have to, like you have to have servers that are like mapping the data together. So people can't just use a regular mail client at that point. Um, and because you have to store some of this stuff on a server, that means like it can't just be like a free mail server like Google unless you have a lot of money to somehow bankroll it. So I don't know how it would have ever made money or anything. I wasn't thinking that stuff as far through, but I started working on it. I actually built out like most of a mail client. I, I, should, I shouldn't say most. I built out an entire mail client. It had some bugs, but it, it was a, a web-based mail client and it did a lot of the things I wanted to do. It would... um. This was before Google did like the promotion, like the tabs that sort of separated emails into promotional and stuff like that. So I was doing some of that stuff too. Um, and we, we launched on a couple of different websites and a bunch of people signed up and tried it, but nobody really stuck around was part of the issue. So at that point I was thinking, well, I don't really know what the next steps are. So I went and talked with a company. Um, it was, the company was called Streak. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's, um, they build like a CRM that like sits on top of Google's Gmail. Uh, at least that's what they were at the time. I, 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 have a, I have a question before. I'm going to interrupt you a lot, and I apologize for that. But before we talk about you going back into the sort of the workforce, and, wait, and by the way, how long did you work on that before you went back into the work? Did you do the full year, or was it six months? It wasn't the full year. It was, what, I know we built, I think it was about three months to build something I thought was good enough to like show what we were trying to do. And it, it definitely wasn't perfect, but it was enough to get there. So we did like maybe three months, released it. And then we started like trying to do things like getting more customers and doing stuff like that. But it, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. So that wasn't um, as productive as it should have been. But here's my other question. At that point, are you wishing you hadn't left Google? <laughs> At, 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 at any time, does it go in back of your head like, oh, man, I should have just stayed? So I wasn't worried about it because whenever I'd accepted the offer at Google, I had offers at other places. And at the time, um, like the friend I mentioned who dropped out of school, went to work at Facebook, I met up with him whenever I moved out to California. And I got to know a lot of his friends really well because most of the people on my team at Google were older. So they weren't necessarily doing the same type of things I would have wanted to do outside of work. Um, but all of his friends from Facebook were all much younger. So I ended up hanging out with them. And I, at this point, I probably was good friends with eight different people who worked at Facebook. And I knew by acquaintance, like 30 plus different people that we'd hang out with and play board games and other so stuff. Did you end up at and Facebook? Several of them were, did you ever end up? At no, Facebook? I didn't, but did they, I did not. They didn't try but to recruit you. Several of them were trying to get me to go okay. to Facebook this whole time. So like, I wasn't <laughs> too worried in the sense that I'm like, I can get something else if I need to. I'm not too worried about that. But why not? Why didn't you go to Facebook? You didn't want to work on PHP. I don't know what they work. I don't know what their tech stack. So when I was like. doing the startup stuff, I just I really loved what I was doing. Like I was having a blast, like building something and really moving quickly with it, and not like getting stuck in this like we'd work for two weeks on something and there's like nothing to really show for it because we either rewrote something or like sort of just in big corporate worlds things move a little bit slower. And I was loving the like fast paced startup type lifestyle. So what I ended up doing was talking with another company that was building something in the related space to what I was in. Um, 
I don't, I don't remember how I found out about them, but they were up in San Francisco, which was like a half hour away from Mountain View where I was. And I drove up and I met them in their office and I talked with them a couple times and I ended up working with them on like a trial basis for like a week, maybe a week and a half. And it was pretty quickly clear at the end of the trial basis that while I loved what they were working on, I didn't think I was a good fit for them because their back end was in Java and their front end was, it was essentially a Chrome extension. So it was all JavaScript. And at the time I had like very little JavaScript experience and they had a very complex JavaScript application. And I was just like, I don't know JavaScript well enough right now. So I'd have to learn that. And I was like, and I don't really love JavaScript for some reason. So I was like, I don't think this is what I want to do. And so we talked for a little bit and what ended up happening was they had gone through Y Combinator, which is like a startup incubator. And they knew somebody else who was working on a startup who would, who basically he'd, he wasn't a programmer, but he had done a bunch of market research, had generated like a big client list of people that could potentially be customers early on. Um, he'd done a bunch of like legwork and they're like, he's looking for somebody to help him build this. Are you interested in talking with him? So I met up with um, this person's name was Jarek Streben. So I met up with him and what ended up happening was I ended up joining him to build this startup then. Um, that startup was called Easy Post. It's a, uh, it's like an API that essentially takes all the different shipping carriers and unifies them under one API. So they're still around today. That, that company actually has done very well. So he and I started this company and I, we got stupidly lucky. I think some of this was naivety, like just me not understanding, but he had been talking with investors because he had worked at a VC fund as like a, uh, like a, whatever the like sort of entry level position is there. So when I started building, he started talking with investors and we had a couple different meetings. And in one of the meetings, we, I forget how many people we had signed up and like, we were start, starting to get actual customers that were using the product, but it was very, very simple at first. I think the first version only worked with USPS and it didn't do a lot. It was just a couple things, but he had this big list of customers and like, he knew how much they were spending on postage and he knew how big of a problem it was for them and how much engineering hours they were wasting on trying to just make all this stuff work. So when he, we talked to this one VC, he had made it sound like another VC he had talked with was already like committed to giving us money. And I think it was him being young too. Like he, if you've ever talked to investors, they are very good at not saying no is how I'll put it. So they don't like to say no, because then if something, if, if for some reason you become very attractive as a startup, they're like, well, I never really said no, I'd like to invest now. But they also don't say yes, like in, in they do, but like they don't always say yes. So they're like just not saying no, but not really saying yes. He took is like, yes, they're going to invest in us. So when we went to meet with another investor, we both kind of went in with that confidence of we already have an investor with this much money. Like we don't actually need your money, but we'd like to work with you if you want to work with us. So we had all this confidence in the world. And I think that ended up like really working to our advantage and they invested in us pretty quickly. And then once we had one investor, they started introducing us to others because no investor wants to see something they invested in sort of tank. So they want to get other people invested. So they'll make introductions and we continued building and long-term we ended up meeting with, um, it was a company called Teespring, which I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, they're essentially at the time, what they were doing was like Kickstarter for like t-shirt designs is how I'd simplify it. So like if you have a soccer team, like a local soccer team and you want to get shirts for your whole team, but you don't want to like pay the upfront cost, you'd essentially set up a design there and everybody would go pay for their one t-shirt. And as long as you got a certain number of t-shirt orders, they would go print the campaign and, and send the t-shirts out to everybody. So something along those lines is what it was. And they were shipping a lot of stuff and they were running into the issues that we were aiming to fix. So like they would, they would try to ship out a campaign that sold a thousand t-shirts. And when they'd go to buy postage for all of them, the, all their integrations would just fall flat on their face. Like different things would happen. They'd get rate limited and it just wasn't working. So we had met with them and we'd started building this batch processing product that it would essentially take all their orders at once, but then we would, we knew kind of how the APIs worked in their limits and we would gradually make sure it didn't screw up and go through the whole process and get them all. And then we'd sort of send them back uh, webhooks that would give them status updates on how everything was going. 
So they had gone through Y Combinator and they knew how big of a problem it was and they were growing. So they introduced us to Y Combinator and like had a supply. And I think we got rejected the first time. And then the second time we applied, we got accepted. So then we ended up doing that, which was a pretty fun, crazy experience. Um, like crazy isn't like just exciting and just seeing all the different companies being built. Um, and in my batch was like core OS was the founders of core OS were in the YC batch that I did. So like seeing that technology sort of grow from the ground up and some of the others was pretty cool. Dude, that's amazing. I had no idea this part of your story that you were at Google, you did the startup, you got into a YC combinator, um, sort of thing. Like, and none of this is easy. Like people no. struggle <laughs> and work really hard and study really hard just to get one of those things. And you're, you're like in the right place at the right time. It seems, um, I, at the time, I think I was working like 14 hours a day, like just crazy hours. And I should take a step back to say when you'd asked about my wife, um, when I was working at Google, um, her brother was, had, had moved out to California and I forget what he was doing, but he had come to play board games with me when I had all his friends that worked at Facebook and he was talking to some of them that worked at essentially Facebook had like a help desk. Um, think of it like the genius bar at an Apple store where employees would come with issues with their computer and they would help them fix it. And one of them, I don't know if they managed it or if they'd started there and then moved up in the company, but they were talking to him and he was basically saying that he'd like to get a job like that. And they started like sort of drill, like we're, we're playing board games and all of a sudden they're quizzing him on all this different stuff. And after a while, I think they realized that he actually really knew a lot of his stuff. He just didn't have a college degree or anything to sort of like get him in the door. So they actually started prepping him for an interview and eventually got him a job. So he got the job at Facebook. He moved up to um, a Mac sysadmin role where he was like managing all the MacBooks there. And now he works at Square, or actually he's at Stripe. Sorry, he's at Stripe doing that. So like he moved all the way up. But at one point, whenever he was out there, his sister came to visit for spring break. And as I said, like I'd known my wife, but I'd never really seen her past like middle school years or something. And whenever she came out, we were all hanging out together and I don't remember how, but somehow we ended up going on a date. And then I think we had one date and then she went back to school. So it was like a weird, like long distance type thing, but it was still new. But luckily it was only for one semester. And then she came back out to California for an internship and like the next summer. And then she had one semester left of college and she somehow managed to like get the internship to count for more credits. And she only had like one or two classes to finish online. So she ended up moving, um, in with her brother for a long time and then eventually she moved in with me while she was finishing all this up and we got engaged and, and got married and everything so she i think we got married we got engaged before i left google i know that and i think we got married a little while later while i was doing all the yc startup stuff so she was with me through all of that crazy stuff and i'm working like 14 hours a week or 14 hours a day not a week <laughs> <laughs> um 14 hours a week would have been great but um so it was kind of hard for her, I think, just like she's in this place where she doesn't know a ton of people and she, she got a job and some other stuff. So she met people, had friends, but I was just never around. And I think that's one of the things people don't like sort of think about is the fact that when you do these hard things, sometimes you're just working so much that you're just, you kind of put everything else on hold for a while, which sucks. But I can also say that it gave me the freedom to do other stuff later in my life. So I'm glad I did it then. But now I'm sure she's like, we did that already in our relationship. So now I need you around. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's part of the reason why like me traveling to go do um, a bunch of conferences or to like to do training in person or something. It's hard to do that because she's seen what it's like when I'm not around and she doesn't like that. And she's like, I like you being here with the kids and with me and like we can do all these family things. And I get that. I, I like being around with the kids. I like putting my daughter to bed every night. Um, and that would be really hard to miss. So it's not that I'm opposed to doing this other things, but it's, it's also like trying to find that balancing act of, of where to be with life. All right. So we got five minutes left. So I want to, this happens to me every time. Um, cause we run out of time, but so do me a favor here and tell me the conclusion of this startup and then how you get into 
starting to work with Go and Go for Eyes and all that stuff? So I started looking at Go because the the startup that I had started, we interacted with a bunch of different shipping APIs. And so like when somebody would say, hey, I want a rate for shipping a package from like Pennsylvania to California, whatever, we would actually connect to all those different APIs. And we were using um, concurrency, or you basically you're threading off to do all this stuff. And Ruby just wasn't good. We were, it was all written in Ruby on Rails. <clears throat> and Ruby wasn't really good for this because you would make an API call. We'd have to connect to you know five different API or shipping APIs ourselves to get sort of back results and send them to you. And and in Ruby, you have like a single server that can handle one web request at a time. So most of this web request is just waiting around for responses. And it was just really inefficient. So I started looking at Go because I'm like, I need something that does this better. And Go's concurrency and everything else was just like, this looks really nice. So I started dabbling with it then. Um, and then the short version is that I ended up leaving the startup. I said, like, it, the company's still there. It's still doing great. But I had left to go do something else because it just wasn't the right place for me to be at the time. Um, and I started working with another startup and they sort of had similar issues. So I continued learning Go on the side, but I was still writing Ruby on Rails. And while I was learning like Go on the side, I started jotting down things like that I wished was easier to learn. Um, the best way I could put this is when I learned Ruby on Rails, um, Michael Hartle wrote this thing called the Rails Tutorial which is a like really fantastic tutorial for like learning to build your first web application with Ruby. And it, it has like tests and everything. And it was just like, if you went through the whole thing and understood it all and build an application using it, you, you were almost ready for a junior like Ruby or Ruby on Rails like developer role. Um, and I went to go and I kept running into the same issues that I think a lot of people do. Like, how do I structure my code? How do I do all this stuff? And I started just sort of writing my learnings down in a blog just because I'm like, well, I want to write them down somewhere. And over time, I got this idea in the back of my head, like, I'd love to make that same type tutorial, but for Go. So it was just kind of like an idea that I jot down notes for. And I did this for several years, I believe, before finally I like took the leap and I was like, okay, I'm in between jobs right now. Like, I don't have anything. I want to spend some time on my own to see if I can make this a thing. Because at that point, I'd been writing blog posts. I had a mailing list with some people. Um, I knew there was interest in what I was sort of teaching and showing, but I had never like stuck it into a concrete product. And so I launched that, and it made very little money the first year. Um, I don't remember exactly how much. But I think by the second year, I had made like $40,000 in sales, which wasn't like software engineering salary but it was enough to get by and enough to sort of show me that there was interest in this thing. So you're not working, you're not working another job at that point. Like you're no, I, I had done a ton of work before that. Like while I was working on that, when I was learning, go on the side, I just jot down notes and like blog posts. And a lot of those blog posts became the basis for what would eventually become. No, no, no. Yeah. But like, again, you're such a good saver that all the money that you generated from those two startups, you had enough to sort of carry you now it's almost like two years to work on this endeavor well so when i went to when i did the like y combinator back startup once we got funding we were paying ourselves you know like a reasonable salary it wasn't like google salary but it was okay um whenever i left there my wife and i actually decided at that point we were married at this point and we wanted to have kids eventually so we both decided to move back home to pennsylvania and that drastically cut costs um to give you like a comparison the first house that i ever bought with my wife cost i think one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for a three-bedroom house so very different from like san francisco where that same house would have been like 1.2 million dollars or something yeah i i did the same thing in 1994 in south florida my first house was a three-bedroom 1400 square feet it was like one hundred and twenty-five thousand. like but you can't do that today like you're you're saying you did that it's it's hard depending on where you go like i know the town i'm in now I, I don't, a lot of people wouldn't like it but i grew up there my family's there when you want to raise kids i think having family nearby is important at least for us it was um so yeah we ended up here and it's it's a much lower cost of living so this allowed me to sort of work on the courses as a let's see how this goes and then i can get a job after that if i want because in my mind i was always like if this doesn't turn into something full-time that's fine 
like it'll at least help me find a job in the sense that it's pretty clear that I at least know what I'm talking about if I'm teaching it and people are like, you know, all that stuff's there to sort of prove that I, I should have a rough idea of what I'm doing. Yeah, but you you gave yourself enough runway again to do this without stressing about having I've always had to work my whole life. I never was able to save at that level. So I always had to have a job or some income coming in regardless of kind of what I wanted to do. I, I find it fascinating and absolutely brilliant that you learned at an early age how to save. I, I just had this conversation with somebody where I said, it doesn't matter what your salary is. It's how much money did you save at the end of the year? If I was going to pay you 50000 a year, but you were going to have 20000 in the bank at the end of the year, or I gave you 120000 and you had nothing, what, what, what do you prefer, right? There's so many people live, they, they move their lifestyle to that salary. And, I, and, and the other conversation was, there's a lot of people who, who have lost their jobs recently at big, big companies where I think the salaries are over bloated to what is reality in the market. And I get nervous that these people were making X and now they're going to have to settle for Y. And if that gap is too big, what are they going to do? Because they can't pay something. But you've always kind of, I mean, you stayed away from that, dude. You've, I got, I don't want to say lucky, but so my grandfather was very poor when he grew up. And because of that, a lot, like uh, the best story I can give is at one point, um, whenever um, I was at his place in Florida and my grandmother was there, there was like my whole family was there and then they were there and we were cooking breakfast in the morning and somebody, I think my grandmother had said something like, we should get a four piece toaster because they had like a little two piece toaster. And he like flipped out. He's like, why would we get a four piece toaster for the one time a year where other people were here? Like he didn't want to buy it. And like, this is not an expensive thing. This is like a $5 thing. And he's very well off now because he started his own company. It grew very, very well. And he was retired at the point. Like he's, he's doing well. He, and he just refused to buy a four piece toaster because he's like, he grew up poor where like you don't spend money on that sort of thing. I'm pretty sure like when he was a kid, he got like maybe one or two gifts on his birth, like on different birthdays. I think only like two of them, he got gifts or something. So like it's, it's, it was a very different environment that he grew up in. And some of the lessons he instilled in my dad, like they've all sort of been, I don't want to say watered down, but like I've been adjusted for our realities, I guess. Um, but I've always been taught like throughout my entire life, like you need to save money and put money aside. And like, if you're spending less than what you're earning and preparing for the future where you're eventually going to want to retire, that's all like, you need to do those things. Otherwise you're gonna have to work the rest of your life. I, I love it, dude. I, I, it's, I've tried to instill that in my kids and um, the ones that are working full time now are doing that. I, I, I bug them a little bit, but I'm like, at least put $500 a month away in, in this investment here. Like, like one of the bit like Edward Jones or something, just do that. I prefer a thousand, but put five, just keep doing it. Pr pretend that money doesn't exist, you know? And I promise you in 10 years, you're going to, you're going to thank me for that. Cause it proves here with you that it's given you the flexibility to take that year, two years in this case, break to see, and you seem to just be an entrepreneur, right? Like even the stuff you're doing with your, your educational material, is entrepreneurial and it's now bringing in enough money. Ooh, thank God. I love that dude. Um, where you can continue to focus on that and the things that you want to do. You're not beholden now to have to get a full-time job um, because of all that time and effort you've put in. And uh, I mean, it's, it's especially rewarding now that like, because I don't have to get a full-time job and because I don't have to like work for somebody that like, if it's a Tuesday and my wife wants to take the kids to do something, we can do that. And I know that I don't have to ask anybody permission. I can just do it. And if I need to catch up on work, I can go work on like Saturday or Sunday, take four hours and try to catch back up. But that's the type of flexibility that I think I would really struggle to take a normal full-time job at this point, because I've, I've been doing this essentially for, it feels like a decade at this point, <laughs> it probably hasn't been, but. Okay. So, so now I'm going to throw this at you. I'm going to give us five more minutes here. Um, we're 12 years in to go. I think we've got another eight years before nobody's going to need training anymore. Just like what happened with Ruby, right? At some point, Ruby went from corporate training to boot camps to now gone. 
And I think it's going to be that 20 year mark where you have to decide, are you going to do a boot camp and go? And I don't want to do that because that's a lot of work, right? So I, I, I think you got eight more years here. So how are you future? What, what's your future planning for the time when nobody's buying your training material anymore because they don't need it? So, so I guess in your mind, are you thinking, why are you thinking boot camp has to be the next step? Or like, why do you think there's no training material? Either everybody's getting all the training they need already in company because everybody there's, there's enough very strong developers in go already in every company where they're getting their training there. So they don't need a class and they don't need, um, say the materials that we have right now, they just, there's no market for it anymore. Just like I would say there's no market for that in Ruby anymore. Right. And so I, the natural step was boot camp. That's what I've seen at least over the last 20 years. So maybe I'm wrong there. I think, I guess I think Ruby is like that now more because a lot of new companies aren't using Ruby. Like, I don't feel like Ruby is growing as a language, if that makes sense. Um, I think there's the developers who use it and they're continuing to use it productively, but I don't see a lot of new companies using it. I think as long as Go is growing and like more companies are using it to build stuff, I think there will be a market there. And I think that market will last longer than Ruby's just because I feel like Go does a better job of replacing things like Java and stuff that have been around forever. Whereas like Ruby, I don't want to call it like the flavor of the week, but it was, it was one of those things where like when you're building web applications and it's sort of linked to a bunch of startups and things like that, it's a little bit different in that sense. Um, whereas like when you get to these languages that are being used at big corporate environments, I feel like they stick around a long time. So I, I, hope I guess you're my, right. my first thing would be like, I hope you're right, John. I, I, I think it'll be here longer. But to answer your question, um, a lot of it is just setting money aside and sort of trying to get to a point where I have the flexibility to figure out what I need to do at any given time. Um, I could always take a job if I have to. I don't know how great I'd do at that. Um, I think that a lot of the skills I've learned as well could be transferred to another language if I wanted to do that. Um, so I think there's some different opportunities in that sense. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my future, John, from what I see as a like you, uh, um, a business owner having to predict the future to make sure revenue continues to not just drop or stagnate, but grow. I'm seeing this year a huge sort of excitement that I hadn't seen before with Rust. And I'm starting to see and feel more and more that if it's greenfield, that people are looking at Rust much more seriously than they ever have before. And if it's a rewrite, they're seriously looking at Rust um, more seriously than they have before. And I think that if we're transitioning at, at Arden, not me, dude, I'm 55, I'm 53, sorry, I'm kind of done. I, I wanna ride out the next eight years with Go and I'm gonna be happy. But we're transitioning into Rust now. We're, we're seriously, um, putting bets on it because I think this is the next big thing for corporate training for material like yours. And so my, my thing to you is uh, start looking at rust, start going through the same process you went with go with rust now and get yourself set up a year from now to have rust sizes. And I think by having both, you're going to ride out the next eight years of revenue with go, and then you're going to give yourself another 10 or 15. Um, on the Rust side. That's that's my bet right now, John. Rust is um, from a training material and corporate training about to take take over what I've seen over the last 10 years ago. Well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> we will see, dude. We will see. Uh, hopefully I'm retired by then, but we will see. All right, dude, we are so out of time here and I could just keep talking to you, um, but we've got to end here. So I love the story. I had no idea of some of the parts of the story. Uh, and I love everything you're doing with Go and, and Go for Sizes and all of that. And if anybody's looking for self-study training material, especially if you're kind of just getting into Go, and I even have this on my uh, in my Go training repo, like go, go check out John's. I'm not good at beginner stuff, honestly. I'm good after, I'm good at the intermediate advanced level. 
beginner stuff is so hard to do and so hard and John's done it. So I don't want to do that. So <laughs> go check out John's stuff seriously. And then when you feel like you've mastered that, then you can come and look at some of my stuff. Um, John, last thing, if anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to this, they have questions. Um, what's the best way for them to reach out? And we'll get this in the show notes. Uh, email is John Cal or John at Calhoun.io. So that's J O N at C A L H O U N dot I O. I have to spell it because typically people spell John J O H N and my full name is Jonathan. So I don't spell it that way. Okay. Brilliant. All right. Thanks John for all your time today. This is a great story. And this is John and Bill signing off at the R Labs podcast. Thank you for listening to us today and hope to see everybody again real soon.